Hello and welcome to the Crimson Stitchery, a video channel about making all things beautiful and useful. My name is Anushka and you can find me elsewhere online as a sour telling, that's a sour telling, which is my username on Instagram and Ravelry, where we also have a Ravelry group. Show notes for this video, as usual, can be found in the down bar here on YouTube, so do click beneath there for links and, um, you know, links to relevant things that I mention in the video. So thank you so much for joining me. Um, I want to say right at the outset, thank you very much for being here, for watching, and if you've watched my last video, thank you very much for everybody who commented and wished me well and offered um, really generous advice and were really open in sharing kind of what you've been going through. Um, if you didn't watch the last video, basically, um, I spoke quite candidly about how I was doing um, in terms of this self-isolation period that we're all currently in. It feels like the whole world is in, or at least everybody that I seem to be talking to and um, it's dominating the news and media. Um, so yeah, just a big thank you very much for that and I hope that you are doing okay. And if you're not doing okay, then I hope that you are managing to um, access things that you need that will make you better. Um, so I've got, I'm not sure how long this episode is going to be because I always, um, you know, either think that I don't have enough and it takes ages or, or vice versa. So we'll see. But I've been doing a little bit of crafting, a little bit of knitting and a little bit of sewing um, recently. So yeah, I'm just without further ado, I'll just talk about what I've been up to over the last two weeks. Um, as I mentioned last time, though I've been at home, I'm not on furlough. I'm still expected to work remotely and I'm not doing very well at that kind of struggling. So free time is um, still feels a little bit um, kind of few and far between. But um, yeah, it's important to to take time off. And as someone pointed out to me, you know, a global pandemic is not a writing retreat. Much as we're all um, kind of tied to these productivity, high productivity kind of ideals at the end of the day, we're in a really difficult, a really difficult place in our in our global society and um, we just have to do the best that we can. Um, yep, so without further ado, I'll get into what's in my knitting basket. So I haven't been doing tons of knitting, um, but I have got a little bit further on my second sock. So these are my Christmas socks. I've just kind of carried on knitting up the Christmas yarn that I had. This one I got um, in a swap, which was really lovely. And yeah, I've just kind of, I think I was at the heel last time and I've knit up there, um, kind of having my hands below the webcam, <laughs> below the screen um, on a few conference calls. So that's been kind of nice. Socks are normally my go-to commuting project. I have a fairly long commute. Um, it takes up, well, it takes up to an hour to get where I need to go in central London generally, um, as I live on the outskirts of the city. So socks are generally my commuting project. Um, and obviously I've not had any commuting for gosh what is it now we we're coming to the end of the third week we me and my partner have been at home since the evening of the monday the 16th of march um so yeah not a lot of um sock knitting has been had but um i've just been plowing along and these are kind of growing on me i think something about them being kind of so hideously bright <laughs> um I'm starting to enjoy, and my sister pointed out that they were like elf socks, um, which I think is totally right. So yeah, just um, going on these, and it is very cheerful, and that is really nice. And I think at this point, um, we really need colour and you know comedy and light-hearted things just to keep us all going when there's literally doom and gloom like everywhere you turn. It feels like. Um, speaking of colour, if you follow me along on Instagram. Again, my username is a sour telling. Um, I've been running for the past week or so a daily photo challenge called hashtag daily colour fix. And American viewers, please note that colour is spelt the British way, C O L O U R, in order to access the full um, hashtag. And a few people are joining in there. And 
please, please do join in me on my daily colour fix if you use Instagram because it's such a joy to just click over onto that hashtag and see what other people um, are up to and kind of seeing posts um, pop up there. And in case you're wondering, if you couldn't figure it out by the name, um, daily colour fix is literally just taking like five minutes out of your day to look around you and find something colourful and joyful. Um, you know, I think that the act of looking for something colourful, kind of sitting there, thinking about the composition, capturing it and writing a short caption, it really forces you to think about it and you're dedicating time to kind of something that's outside of ourselves and also just looking around us and seeing what is beautiful. Um, I obviously have a lot of rather colourful things around me and your home might have a different palette and a different colour scheme or you might have access to different hues and that's obviously totally fine um, and that's really coming through on the hashtag as well when you, you see what other people are putting in it's really reflective of the surroundings um, that they are in so yes daily colour fix that's been really lovely and these did crop up on my daily colour fix as well I just spent so many days just sitting at my desk which is quite a horrible old table it's like very rickety and and disgusting it's not like a beautiful vintage piece in any way and then um, the tabletop is white and the curtains are kind of beigey beigey green um, vintage curtains that I got from my grandma just because they happen to fit my bay window really well and curtains for anyone that's ever looked into buying curtains are pretty expensive so I'm repurposing vintage curtains for now but they wouldn't be my first choice so um, I was basically sitting in, in this sort of grey beige and pale green not my wheelhouse at all not my colour um, colour wheel and yeah I had these very very lurid <laughs> stripy um, crazily bright socks next to me and they cheered me up a little bit so that was really lovely daily colour fix. Um, next thing I'll mention is that I've finally sewn the buttons on this baby cardigan that I've been knit. I actually knit this up very very quickly um, and it's the uh, flax pullover by Tin Can Knits and I turned it into a cardigan and I had all of these issues around the gauge and I, at first I couldn't work out why and then I realised it's because I'd made a mistake because I was looking at the pattern on my phone and then occasionally I was double checking things on my computer and I realised that I had one version of the pattern that's written for um, fingering weight yarn, I think it's Flax Light, on one device and the original one which is um, I believe DK or Aran weight, I'm not quite sure but it's heavier on the other device and I was kind of like seamlessly going between them and just knitting, knitting away and then suddenly was like oh no none of these numbers um, add up and I did a lot of fudging and I think it's turned out okay um, and it's a baby garment so you know it's only going to be worn for like six months of the items, of the item, <laughs> the item's only going to be worn for six months of that person's life. Um, so yeah, just a word of warning, learn from my mistakes. And then this is really ready to be packed up and sent to the recipient. So hopefully I'll get out to the post office today because last time I checked she hadn't given birth, but that was a couple of weeks ago at this point. And I'm sure she'd um, appreciate receiving this. Um, next thing that I've been knitting on the most but has now paused is the start of my hat blanket and this is the middle square of the hat which is a full hat, a lap hat as someone pointed out, um, which is a uh, garter stitch square knit on the bias and this is part of my stashless 2020 um, exercise and if you're new to the channel since the beginning of the year I've been running a community initiative for the Crimson Stitchery occurring on Instagram and in my Ravelry group and here on YouTube with the hashtag stashless2020 and the idea is that we're going to find individual ways of working with what we have, appreciating and using what we have, finishing leftovers and overall trying to bring less into our stash so that we aim to be stashless or simply stash a little bit less through the year. And obviously this is having different ramifications given the um, current status of the global pandemic. Um, some people are finding this an excellent way to work through, you know, things that have, they've squirreled away right at the backs of the cupboard. And other people are taking this as an opportunity to invest in um, young businesses essentially so it's it's working out differently for different people and I have therefore taken a little pause on recording um, the supplementary videos for Status 2020 just because I think I'll get back to it when um, things seem a little bit 
De-escalated seems flippant, that's not what I mean, but I just mean when we're a little bit, you know, further down the line and it feels kind of less, um, I, I'm not sure what, what, where I'm trying to go with this, but hopefully, hopefully you see what I mean. I'm just going to get back to the Stashers 2020 series a bit later in the year. Um, meanwhile, what I'm working on, aside from these podcast uh, vlog videos, um, where I talk about it's like a show and tell, um, is tutorials. And um, I'll get on to why I uploaded last week, but I'm working on the um, button tutorial for sewing buttons on cardigans on knitted fabric. So look out for that upcoming soon. And um, anyway, back to this. So this is my central garter stitch square, and it's knit um, with yarns holding double, holding yarns double, and that's because um, the theme on our Ravelry group for March and April was double up. So um, marling and brioche and um, yeah, stripes and just thickening up fabrics. So. I thought that was a great opportunity and I've used all different yarns and um, this main square down here includes a strand of silk alpaca whereas up here by the time we get to this corner it's two strands of Shetland wool so up here it's like it's quite a lot thicker and stiffer you can see it kind of really wants to hold up whereas here it's just completely completely floppy and I think by the time I block out this Shetland section, it will it will soften up, um, especially if I block it in a bit of um, vinegar, I think, white vinegar. Um, but yeah, it's turned into a mull because I ran out of these yarns and I really, really like what has happened. Um, I've got kind of this pale and medium grey here, a dark grey and medium grey. And the medium grey is like a slightly darker tone. Then I've got a dark charcoal with a blue and then a dark charcoal with a dark grey. So it's worked out really well. And um, my, so this is a hap. So then I'll be picking up stitches and knitting a lace border uh, and then another knitted on lace border. So two different types of lace borders. <laughs> if anyone's ever knitted a hat, you'll know exactly what I mean. And I was thinking that I will be doing all of the lace borders in different colours. So I'll start to bring in my burgundies, my reds, um, my different shades in different tones held together and then I was thinking because this looks so nice when it's folded in half like this I was thinking that I'd also like to write up this hat pattern and do it as a full hat and a half hat that functions more of, more as a shawl and that actually it would be really great to have some test knitters um, work on the pattern for me and to kind of help me out and help me devise the pattern as I as I come up with it and you'd be really the test knitters would um, kind of be quite involved in terms of the collaborative process because um, of all of the like fading and the marling and the colour matching and stuff like that. So um, if anyone out there is interested in being a test knitter for a HAP project, it's pretty big, um, but I did use, um, I think it was six millimetre needles and um, two strands of fingering, which range to kind of two strands of fingering. Sometimes it was two strands of DK getting quite chunky, but sort of between fingering and DK yarns held double. Um, yeah, if anyone's interested in being a test knitter, please click in the down bar below and I'll have a submission form for you to complete. Um, you will need to have quite a bit of yarn on hand in your stash, so hopefully that will be a good and creative thing for some of you. And um, I'll be looking for two people to knit a full hap and two people to knit a half hap um, along with me as I'm literally writing this pattern. So um, you could be getting on with the garter stitch section as I finesse the kind of of lace instructions so yes let me know if you'd like to be a test knitter um, by clicking the link below and yeah I've taken a pause on this just because it was so fun to just work on something garter stitch that I didn't even have to think about um, for quite a while and now I need to do the maths and so on and so forth for working at the lace so I will hopefully get to that over the Easter bank holiday weekend which I've decided to take off Next up is mending stories and um, I've only started a mend this week because it's a little bit delicate and it's just about getting that right balance of time, uh, mental capacity and light um, that allows me to do this. So basically I've got this vintage lace tablecloth um, that's quite nice, it was just picked up for like 50p or something in an antique shop by a um, old classmate of mine when we were doing our bachelor's degree and she dip dyed it this lovely cornflower blue it's pretty faded and it's also quite tea stained so I'll probably be doing an over dye at some point um, and it's very old and it's it got very ripped so it's got this section here which is um I think it's called something like cut thread work it's very very old-fashioned um, and it's 
where you basically pull the threads of linen around to create lace within the actual base cloth itself. Something along those lines. Um, lady in a car boot fair once explained it to me in great detail and um, it sounded very very complicated and I must admit that my mind was thinking as, as it was being explained to me, my goodness that's such a lot of effort to spend on a tablecloth. <laughs> um, which yeah it's kind of surprising maybe that I had that thought since I make so many of my own things but just something about so much effort on a decorative tablecloth just I don't know, it seemed next level, but anyway, so it's um, got very worn out and ripped in places. You can see there's a tear, large tear here and, and smaller tears here and on the other side too. So I'm being a bit creative about how I repair this because I do like the tablecloth, even though it's only a tablecloth. Um, and I've started off by doing a blanket stitch all the way around the edge of the bottom. So I'm going to do that all the way around and then I'm going to go back in and I'm going to catch that top piece of cloth down into the blanket stitch um, itself and yeah hopefully that will work and then there's also this tear right in the middle um, and I'm not sure because it's it's quite fine linen cloth and it's very worn away I don't know whether to do a patch or to do lots of stitching and, and attempt to darn it I'm not quite sure. So if anyone has any ideas, I'd be very welcome to hear them. Um, so yeah, that's the tablecloth. And I've been meaning to work on this for ages. So I guess that the one good thing about not having the option to have much of a social life at the moment means that I am getting done um, quite a lot of old jobs that have been hanging around at the bottom of my list. So, you know, silver lining to every cloud as they say. Um, next I'm going to talk about sewing and I've only been doing a little bit of sewing. Um, firstly, quite unpicturesque and it's, um, yeah, it's not going to look great on camera but this is basically two pieces of cloth <laughs> because I've hemmed up a pair of curtains, quite nice fabric, I'll show you the fabric, it's sort of like a window pane um, woven effect between like herringbone weave and moments of plain weave. Can you get that effect at all? Kind of. Anyway, it's white linen, it was cheap as chips, and I got it from some shops that line Walthamstow Market, um, which is, I think it's, is it called Europe's Longest Street Market or something, or the UK's at least, um, and it's quite well known for its inexpensive fabric shops. Um, and I got this fabric in the autumn, I think in October, and it's again sat around for ages. And my wardrobes um, don't have doors, they just have the rails of clothes, so I've needed to um, have some kind of curtain on them for quite a while to protect the clothing from sun damage. So I did a very, very simple thing. I simply turned down the sides of the fabric and stitched down the selvage, hemmed the bottom, hemmed the top, and then added some um, very old um, cotton, I think it's actually poly cotton tape to the top, with which to run through the um, wire of the um, neck curtain holder thingy. Um, hope that makes sense but yeah it's not, it's not gonna look great but I did that and that was quite a big job and they need a really good press before they're hung but it's no point pressing them as until the hanger's ready because um, yeah they're just gonna get creased again so that took up quite a while so that was really good um, and then the last thing is I stitched down a lining into this cloth bag and um, this bag um, it used to be just a normal tote bag and I created a tutorial for how to turn it into a drawstring bag and released it last week so um, please do click over and watch that tutorial. I did the lining um, last weekend in my new little uh, desk sewing nook kind of corner so that was um, yeah that was a new setup for me and having the lining is, has been really good because it's just made the bag feel much more robust so it was really worth doing so if you've got a couple of spare hours and you've got a bunch of spare bags you can knock up a, <laughs> a whole load of handy drawstring bags without very much effort and you can also do it you know if, if you're a knitter not a sewer you can also do it by hand um, so that's that my bag full of leftover yarn for my hat The last bit of sewing I've, I've done um, 
is fairly visible because I basically sewed up a bunch more handkerchiefs which I did show you last week but this is how I folded them up and put them in this little pot that I keep on the coffee table next to a box of actual tissues and thanks very much to everyone who commented about the hankies and said that you um, either also are doing the same thing with the hankies or that your um, family is also grossed out by the hankies or that we're kind of being mad together using hankies so um, hay fever season is now in full swing I'm a little bit short in breath I'm very you know sniffly even though I've taken my antihistamines already and um yeah I'm finding that I'm getting through these at a much faster rate so I sewed um, I believe it was four more out of this floral kind of Laura Ashley-esque fabric and then two more out of this uh, more spotty rose hips fabric and fold them up into eighths and put them in the pot and yeah I'm already going through them really quickly so there's there's three in the pot at the moment the rest are scattered in they're in various different laundry piles and in pockets and I feel like I need to sew up a whole bunch more already just because it's nice um you don't want to feel like you're at your last hanky and that you're going to run out it's nice to feel like you have abundance so um yes that's been really good and it's definitely saving on tissues um which sort of feels um, especially important now thinking about waste because I don't know what's happening where you're living but in my London borough they sent us a notice on the day before the refuse collection saying that they were no longer collecting recycling um, and we were just expected to put our recycling in our normal refuse bags which means that it's going to be incinerated doesn't it I mean they didn't they didn't say whether it'd be sorted at a later date or anything like that and I think um I think it's really terrible to be honest with you like I know that most plastic can't be recycled anyway but in terms of paper cardboard glass and metal um it seems really awful that that's yeah not going to be not going to be recycled so I'm putting loads more stuff in the compost um paper and cardboard it's probably going to take absolutely ages to break down but we've got a very large composting bin at the back kind of it's it's one of those Dalek ones that that's what people refer to them as in gardening forums um and yeah I think I'll be piling up my glass and my aluminium and hopefully just storing it away until a later date until it gets out of hand and um, I don't want to be like one of those crazy hoarder people that have just got all of their trash for like the last 10 years still in their backyard but yeah it's definitely something to be thinking about the fact that we're producing so much domestic waste and sort of what are the decisions that we can be making in order to in order to reduce this it's very very pertinent at the moment um lastly we'll just move on to larder life and i did something recently which is quite simple in that i hung an extra laundry line in the back garden i already um, try my best to dry um, everything on the line outside. Um, having a machine dryer is not that common in the UK and definitely not if you live in an apartment in a, in a flat um, but normally we have a, a wooden clothes horse but it can get a bit mildewy and also it's not it's just not really big enough um, and so yeah it's really ideal to have clothes hanging on the line and we just had the idea to hang a second line up and it was kind of really simple but I don't know why we hadn't thought of it before just to be able to hang more items outside and make use of free resources nature in order to dry clothing so just thought I'd mention that in case anyone has a laundry line and has the idea um, and um, is running out of space you know you can pop a second one behind it. So I did that and then um, I really like this larder life section and I like the fact that because it centres around kind of kitchen area and my washing machine is in my kitchen, um, hence mentioning the laundry, that it sort of goes in between food and domestic crafts and other kind of practices and links them up together. Um, larder, larder life and the fact that the larder is a food cupboard, um, a cool food cupboard, um, it's also about storage and preservation so yeah I feel like there's lots of links there and I, I enjoyed speaking about it. So the other thing that we've been doing is learning a new craft um, which is food carving. <laughs> um, this is something that when I told my friends I was doing most of them burst out laughing and I was laughing too and then I said to them wait I know why I'm laughing why are you laughing? And I think it was the idea that we had gone back to basics in a sort of neo-apocalyptic world that we were, me and my partner, were carving wooden spoons. But actually, I've wanted to do this for a really long time, ever since I um, saw a workshop offered at a festival one time and didn't manage to get a spot I've wanted to carve spoons. So 
yeah um i've got a couple of starts of things to show you we haven't managed to complete an actual full-size spoon so the size of um like a dessert spoon that you'd use to eat with but we've got a few small ones um, I'm intending to use a spice scoop so this one here is pretty much finished um, this one needs a little bit more to go and this one which has got a different grain um, hopefully you can see that obviously needs the most work um, till it's done but these two sweet little things are finished and I did them on the last two Saturday evenings or afternoon evenings just sort of sitting around whittling and um, it's been really interesting I've never worked with such hard materials before they've always worked with soft materials with textiles and also as a process um, I'm not at all familiar with sculpting with carving and taking away um, I guess you could argue that sewing is is taking cloth away because you cut it to the right shape but I still think of it as a sort of building externally because then you're transforming the cloth into a 3d shape Whereas with carving, you're forming the 3D shape itself by taking away material. And yeah, I've never done any carving um, as, a, as a practice and a way of thinking. And I'm really, really enjoying it. Um, yeah, just still thinking about it. Yeah, I've always done things about building. So knitting is obviously building fabric. And um, when pattern cutting, I've done a lot of flat pattern cutting, which is the drafting where you use measurements and pencils, but I also quite enjoy draping. And again, that is building shape um, around a form. So yeah, very, very interesting process and a different way of visualizing, um, learning about working with different materials. Ideally, we'd be carving green wood, which is wood that has immediately been felled from a tree, like a branch that's, you know, storm damage or something like that. But um, we haven't, had access to that so we've used some quite old um, cherry wood that was like an old pruning um, I think it's probably about six months old at least um, which is not ideal it might even be seven months old yeah it's not ideal because it's very hard um, it's difficult to work with definitely not good for beginners but at the end of the day you've got to work with what you have um, and yeah it's been very very interesting learning about a new and completely natural material because a lot of the time with the wood especially as this is an old imperfect um tree trunk <laughs> um you know there's splits there's cracks there's knots there's moments where the grain completely moves in in different direction and it bends and so on um it's not kind of your idealistic straight straight up <laughs> up and down tree trunks with no no branches and no knots and stuff so um, yeah, it's very, very organic. And also wood is a living material because it's porous, it's still expanding and contracting. And that was something that I found to my detriment when it came to this. So this weirdly shaped implement started off life as a spoon um, with a proper rounded head. But um, there was basically a split on the back that just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger until um, I just accepted that I was never going to cut out the crack and I needed to work with it. So I've turned it into a scoop instead and it's still not finished and again it's it's now over a week old so the wood is very very hard and it's getting pretty dry which is unfortunate. But you know such is life uh, and I've turned it into a scoop so I'm thinking it would be like a scoop for coffee um, and the handle looks disproportionately long you know I feel like ideally the proportions it'd want to you know go down to there maybe but Again, then again, it is quite nice having a proper handle. Um, and I'm just concerned about when I'm scooping something that it will just fall out of the end. So I'm trying to carve out a much deeper bowl so that the material will fall into the bowl and not fall back out of the bowl. And I'm thinking about the angles and things like that. So I'm cutting the angle in that way to again, encourage the materials to, um, yeah, to kind of nudge into the, the bowl of the scoop. So that's that, really, really enjoying it. And it's something that I've been enjoying doing more than knitting. And I think that the reason is because it's very dangerous um, working with really sharp tools. 
So you really do have to give it your complete and utter focus, otherwise you could um, end up doing quite a bit of damage to either yourself or the tool or the or the object that you're carving or, or your surroundings. So you really have to hone in and focus in a way that with knitting my mind just kind of wanders off. Also there's the fact that my jumper drawer is pretty full so I don't feel the need to knit for myself. I um, have just this morning earmarked a couple of patterns um, to knit one for my grandma, one for my partner and I will be ordering yarn for that this week. Um, which I always knew I was going to do despite Stasha's 2020. Um, I always thought that um, around the spring after I'd completed a bunch of projects using Stash yarn I would buy, buy some yarn as an um, sort of to make it exciting to knit up as a gift for someone and I think um, I haven't shown it today but my oh I've left it elsewhere my crazy crochet um, colourful scrap jumper I think I will get to that in the next couple of weeks before the next episode and hopefully um, crochet up the last sleeve so that will be a great um, reward to be able to have some new yarn to knit so yep that's that so the last section is conversational threads and I am going to be doing a reading for this section which I haven't done in quite a while but have wanted to um, and the reading that I'm going to be giving to you is not one that I found myself it's one that someone actually suggested to me and it's an extract from one of Jane Carlyle's letters. Now I wasn't familiar with who Jane Carlyle was um, and that's because she was a kind of celebrity figure in the 19th century literary world and I am not a um, very knowledgeable about um, 19th century literature or history. I'm much more familiar with what came before and what came afterwards um, and academically um, I think all, I would say all of my research projects, like my self-initiated research projects, have dwelt on 20th century history. So I am not a Victorianist, is that what they're called, or 19th century studies expert. So I didn't know who Jane Carlyle was, um, but I gather that she's pretty famous. And um, yes, she was um, a very highly educated woman herself. Um, and also she was kind of like a what gets called um, like a cultural intermediary, kind of connecting up lots of different literary figures and sort of hosted salons and, and so on. I guess she was precursor to like Gertrude Stein, that, that kind of idea. Um, and it's this passage in one of her letters about a loaf of bread. And the way that this passage was suggested to me is actually quite different from the take that I have given to it after I looked it up. So it was suggested to me um, in a tutorial this week by a really fantastic writing teacher that I was doing a workshop with, with a group of other students. Um, and she is herself a, a fantastic novelist. Um, I will put a link to um, her website below, um, uh, Catherine Grant, um, and just a most amazing and inspiring person to learn from. It was such a joy. I wish I wish she could be my <laughs> personal writing tutor forever. But anyway, it was it was such a wonderful workshop, and she's a wonderful person, um, and I definitely recommend her novels as well. And anyway, so that's the thing about Jane Carlyle and a loaf of bread. And the way that, that Katie, Catherine, um, kind of shared this as an anecdote was that Jane Carlyle was living um, in the middle of Scotland, really far away from any kind of um, social contact. You know, she was living in a house really in the middle of nowhere and it was terrible weather. And she had this um, idea to bake a loaf of bread. And the way that um, this passage was suggested to me is, you know, we were talking about all this isolation and all of this kind of thing and about how it's so difficult to achieve the goals that we that we have set ourselves given that everything in the world is changing around us, our boundaries are shifting and, you know, the world has imposed so many limits and the government has imposed so many limits on what we're capable of doing. And um, Katie's take on this was that she kept thinking about Jane Carlyle and the loaf of bread and how she was able to make a loaf of bread for herself and that sort of suggested that even if we can't do anything else, if we can't do the big things that we wanted to do in life, we can still manage to achieve the small things, which is um, definitely a good lesson. It's about sort of um, jumping over that first hurdle, taking that first step as opposed to looking at it in the larger context of the hundred mile walk or whatever. Um, 
yeah, taking one step as opposed to trying to run a marathon or whatever. Um, but I'm going to read you the passage now, and I have to read it on um, on my computer online as I don't have access to a physical copy. Um, but I'll put a link to the book that I am reading the passage from down below so that you can check it out if you are so inclined. Um, so yeah, I'll read the passage and then I'll say what I've taken from it, which is slightly different. So it's an extract from a letter, and at the beginning I'm not exactly sure what she's referring to, but you kind of get a sense of it as, as it progresses. So I'll read Tina. I can't think how people who have any natural ambition and any sense of power in them escape going mad in a world like this without the recognition of that. I know I was very near mad when I found it out for myself, as one has to find out for oneself everything that is to be of any practical use to one. Shall I tell you how it came into my head? Perhaps it may be of comfort to you in similar moments of fatigue and disgust. I had gone with my husband to live on the little estate of Peak peat bog that had descended to me all the way down from John Welsh, the Covenanter, who married a daughter of John Knox. That didn't, I'm ashamed to say, made me feel Craig and put up a whit less of a peat bog, a most dreary untoward place to live at. In fact, it was 16 miles distant on every side from all the conveniences of life, shops and even post office. Further, we were very poor and further and worse, being an only child and brought up to great prospects, I was sublimely ignorant of every branch of useful knowledge, though a capital Latin scholar and a very fair mathematician. It behoved me in these astonishing circumstances to learn to sew. Husbands, I was shocked to find, wore their stockings into holes and were always losing buttons, and I was expected to look to all that. Also, it behoved me to learn to cook. So I sent for Cobbett's cottage economy and fell to work at a loaf of bread. But knowing nothing about the process of fermentation or the heat of ovens, it came to pass that my loaf got put into the oven at the time myself ought to have put into bed, and I remained the only person not asleep in a house in the middle of a desert. One o'clock struck, and then two, and then three, and still I was sitting there in an intense solitude, my whole body aching with weariness, my heart aching with a sense of forlornness and degradation. That I, who had been so petted at home, whose comfort had been studied by everybody in the house, who had never been required to do anything but cultivate my mind, should have to pass all those hours of the night in watching a loaf of bread, which mightn't turn out bread after all. Such thoughts maddened me till I laid down my head on the table and sobbed aloud. It was then that somehow the idea of Benvenuto Cellini sitting up all night watching his Pericles in the oven came into my head and suddenly I asked myself, after all, in the sight of the upper powers, what is the mighty difference between a statue of Pericles and a loaf of bread, so that each be the thing one's hand found to do? The man's determined will, his energy, his patience, his resource, were the really admirable things of which the statue of Pericles was the mere chance expression. If he had been a woman, living at Craig and Putter, with a dyspeptic husband, 16 miles from a baker, and be a bad one, all those same qualities would have come out most fitly in a good loaf of bread. So that's the end of that passage. And as you can see, I struggled a little bit with the turn of phrase at the beginning, very Victorian 19th century. And um, as she started getting into this anecdote of herself weeping over her terrible loaf of bread, it, it, it definitely all comes together. But I thought this was really interesting for me to read because there's this idea that she's been very heavily educated and that she's, you know, grown up in like a middle class household and um, she's been very petted and comforted at home by her parents. And then she's stuck in the middle of nowhere, 16 miles all around to the closest anything. And she discovers that, you know, husbands wear, lose their buttons and wear holes in their socks. <laughs> Definitely a big um, shock. And then she's expected to run a household when she's been brought up for much more intellectual pursuits. And I think for myself and for, you know, everyone watching this video, I think we would acknowledge that making a loaf of bread is something very impressive to make, be able to make it by hand and sort of um, acknowledging that craft and the skill. But there's this there's this moment where I think in the passage she's she's so full of despair and kind of admits that with such good humor that she can't even do something that she thought was really really basic and it's sort of all of the Latin scholars and the mathematicians in the world you know um, 
kind of all falls away when it comes to what you can actually do in your kitchen and the things that you actually need to do to survive. You need to sew buttons back on your clothes and darn socks and you need to bake a loaf of bread which she discovers is, is really really difficult. Um, so what I took from the passage wasn't that you know even if things are really hard you can make a loaf of bread really well. It was about um, looking at the circumstances that you're in and thinking how can how can you learn um, even when you're so frustrated that you are brought to tears as she was and as I think many of us may have been in recent recent weeks um, seeing this as an opportunity to kind of get back to basics but also learning what are the things that we really value what are the things that are actually important to us what are the things that we really do need um, and I think also in the passage she mentions that it was the beginning of her married life she was very young they they didn't have any money and I think that that's good to acknowledge as well like how far can we go with what we already have? Um, do we really have to continue to spend money? You know, what are the things that we actually need to build around us um, in order to live well and as well as can be in this moment? So that's it for me today. Um, do drop me a comment down below and let me know if you've been learning anything new, anything at all, um, even if it's a new way of doing something you already did, like a new stitch pattern or, you know, if you already know how to sew curtains, maybe you've been sewing clothes or something like that. So I'd really be interested to know um, if you've tried any new skills out. Um, as for me, you know, it's been the wood carving just one day a week, one afternoon a week, um, whittling away. <laughs> and it's interesting that you literally, you whittle away the wood and you do whittle away time, but um, time definitely passes very, very differently, very quickly in the wood carving <laughs> moments. Um, so yes, that's everything for me today. Thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, do give it a thumbs up and uh, drop me a comment down below. And thank you very much for everyone who's been in touch with me. Um, Please do continue to spread the word of the Crimson Stitchery. I always love to hear from my viewers. Hope that you're well. Take care. Bye-bye.